Hi, Misha here, and as most of you know, I like kind of taking parts kits and getting them rebuilt from select fire submachine guns, usually open bolt, to close bolt legal some autos. And recently, at places like Apex, What a Country, I think, Robert uh, Bowman. RTG, these kits have become available. The Yugoslavian Krina Zastava model 1949, or the slightly different model 4957. Now, this is not actually one of those kits. This is an older gun that's been around for quite a while that uh, still has the original barrel here and has the original receiver section it was a display gun and i thought it would be fun to reactivate it and if at first this looks like a soviet ppsh 41 a papa shaw well it does fire 7.62 by 25 double wrap it feeds from very, very similar 35 round double stack single feed mags. It does have the unique folding mag release. It has a selector switch for semi full and the trigger guard. And it has a full length wood stock. It also has a shrouded barrel. But, by now, if I'm getting any of this on camera for you, you'll notice some differences. For example, this is a round tube with a cap on the end. This is a round shroud. And, of course, the barrel's extended out for 16 inches to make it legal. And this is decidedly not a PPSH. 41 safety. So I thought we would kind of compare and contrast this, talk about how it came to be, because there's very scant information on the 49 or the 4957 out there. During and after World War II, Yugoslavia's path under Tito was quite interesting amongst communist states. And one of the first guns they produced after the war was the model 1948 or M48 Mauser here. Of course, an 8mm. And based on the name, you know this was adopted a year later as a kind of complementary sub-machine gun. And I brought the Mauser out because one interesting thing, the butt plate, if you look at the cupped butt plate here, and the one on this, they're very much similar, even with screws in similar positions, although the bottom screw is lower on the uh, M49 because it does have a trap door for a cleaning kit or tools, whereas the Mauser does not, mostly because it has this slot in the stock there. So there's that. Small similarity. There's also kind of a similarity in the shape of the grip. Even kind of similar trigger styling. Got your charging handle on the right side here. It does reciprocate. And they use very similar front uh, sight protectors. Nothing important, but I like little nods like that. So, of course, the Mauser is a bolt action, and the M49 is a submachine gun companion. This thing is about eight and a quarter pounds unloaded. So, not terrible for its day and time. It's about 34 and a quarter inches long. Of course, if you don't have the extension on the barrel. And this here barrel is right about 10 and a half inches with a pretty basic 
muzzle brake slash compensator being on the last end. <laughs> Some interesting features. It has a quick change barrel that releases here. So the barrel can be easily taken out. We have a 100 or 200 meter flip rear sight. We have this safety. We have this fire mode selector here, which is pinned for a semi auto. And again, we have our folding mag release. And then a solid wood stock with a sling mount. Pretty standard stuff. And it has an end cap for disassembly. And as you saw, it does eject from the left side. And of course, firing 7.62 by 25 Stoker Rev. Pretty hot little bottleneck round with a 10 plus inch barrel. It had decently effective range and penetration, although it still is 30 caliber. So this was produced at Kronazestava and was in military service by around 1951. And production and use would continue throughout the 50s. And in 1957, the M4957 would be adopted. And I can't find a complete list of changes. The recoil spring seems to be the major one. But one can imagine there's probably a few other minor differences too. But the takeaway, they tried to make this a little more economical, faster, easier to produce because really the M49 might be in the running for the claim of the last developed generation one submachine gun. And by that I mean made from milled machined type parts including the receiver even though it's a pretty basic tube and having you know nice wood fittings not having a folding stock, and having the longer barrel with the heavier kind of overall weight. Things you see in other submachine guns of that first era. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. They were building these through the 50s. Uh, we don't... I couldn't find at least when production officially ended. But I would imagine by the end of the decade. I mean, because these were shown to be kind of taken out of frontline service mostly throughout the 1960s and then they kind of left the last of the reserves in 1975 and while Yugoslavia did try exporting these including offering a nine millimeter version if customers might be tempted by that the truth is they had no takers so outside of the Yugoslavian army these were only used in limited numbers by say Angola Iraq, and of course North Vietnam, who pretty much used anything that would work. So, there's only a handful of nations that ever really got to use this gun, and I have no idea production numbers. And now it's time for my good old TNW, PPSH-41, the Papa Shaw. And I put the drum in it, but if I let it go, it's just going to roll. Because drums just aren't practical. Originally, this gun, of course, was made for a drum. I'm going to set it down so I can pull it out. 71 rounds, and this was actually copied from the Finnish Suomi for the most part. But in 1942, they developed the 35-round stick mag, which when pretty much every way shape and form was better so really the drums fell out of favor in russia before the end of the great patriotic war so these two guns obviously have a lot in common although you'll notice this doesn't have the mauser esque butt plate still full length stock you'll notice the selector is uh, very similar as is the trigger the uh, mag release but then up here we have a much more spurred off shroud still have a flip rear sight though 
and a slightly different style of protected front side. Also, the PPSH opens up with a button here. I'll show you real quick. Like so. Kind of just a car hood. Of course, in a open bolt. It's pretty simple inside. Whereas uh, our M49 has a cap with a button in the middle. You press in to rotate it off. And then everything comes out the back. This ejects to the left. The PPSH actually ejects upwards. <laughs> the PPSH is slightly lighter at about 8 pounds. It's about 1 inch shorter, about 33 and a quarter. But it has exactly the same length barrel, just over 10 and a half inches. But yeah, this is a round shroud and receiver, cutie barrel. This barrel is uh, pinned in place. Obviously, it can be pulled out, but not very handily in the field. So I think you see some differences. See, the PPSH-41 drum will fit in the Yugo just fine, but Zastava never made drums for these. They stuck with the stick mag because by 1949 that was the best way to go. But since they copied the mag well, yeah. Now our caulking handle is on the on the right side on both. But on the Russian we have a simple safety here on the handle. But again, this has this cross bolt type uh, safety. Very big, very stiff. So there are definitely some major, major differences. And of course, those get accredited to our good friend Beretta. The MAB 38, specifically the 38 and 38A, the early versions. And I think it's pretty obvious. This has a relatively simple machined tubular receiver. A little more complicated than the later Yugo because of the caulking handle situation. Also, this has a non-reciprocating handle, whereas this reciprocates. This has a much more fancy rear sight. This has a bayonet lug, a more complicated muzzle brake, slightly longer barrel. But we have a perforated shroud. We have a, actually a very full length stock on this. <laughs> and this, of course, it fires 9mm. So my pistol grip, storage compartment. But if you notice, the back has this button sticking out. Same as the Yugo. So they disassemble quite similarly. And the original M49 used the same kind of captive recoil system that the original 38 did. Although the M4957 went to a simpler and more traditional, more common, I guess I should say, just spring, as did the later versions of the uh, Beretta here. You can definitely see a commonality. But this is solidly a Generation 1 submachine gun, whereas the PPSH-41 is either a late Gen 1 or a very early Gen 2 because it began to use stampings. But like the Beretta, the Yugo is essentially all milled machined parts, at least where it counts. Flipping them over, you can see a very similar left side ejection port. And you'll notice the Beretta has a manual safety here. Of course, it has this really fun two-trigger arrangement, too. So where did this safety come from? Well, actually, it's another Beretta. In fact, this gun went through several variations in production. The uh, M3842 and M3843 being early 
differences. And then we had the M3844, produced in pretty big numbers. And production would continue at Beretta in Italy. And after the war, they would have the M3849, which had a cross-bolt style safety. And many, well, pretty much all the online sources that mention the safety do a credit. It is a copy from the Beretta M3849. However, both of these do have the same model number of 49. But the Yugo doesn't really seem to have gone into mass production until 1950 or 51. And Beretta had several variants. They even had a squeeze safety version of their 38. Again, they kind of pursued this family for a long time, even turning it into the PM12. But either way, it's a Beretta-inspired Beretta-style safety. Big, easy, very firm. You're not going to knock it. And it's a separate control from your selector. So, no, uh, no worries there. So I think you can uh, definitely see the kind of similarities. So this uh, Yugo, it has a good reputation. It actually has a slower cyclic rate than the PPSH-41. PPSH-41, depending on, of course, the ammo, eh, 900 RPM, give or take. The Yugo, it's said to have 750 to 800 RPM. And that's because of a few things, namely a longer receiver tube compared to the somewhat short distance inside the Russian gun. And also a stronger kind of a recoil spring and kind of even a bolt spring buffer system in the back here. They just kind of slows things down a bit. And I think most would agree that 750 to 800 is a little more manageable than 900 especially considering we're using 35 round mags. But of course they would use those because A, they were cheaper to make, excuse me, cheaper to make, and honestly easier to load, use, and feed into the gun. And if you lost one, hey, no big deal, less bulky. But honestly, even though it was kind of an outdated gun, it worked well for Yugoslavia. So with that said, why, um, yeah, why, why is it kind of unknown, unheard of? Well, when I say it was outdated, it was really outdated. Before and at the very beginning of World War II, yeah, companies, nations were using Generation 1 verging into Generation 2 submachine guns. But through the war, not only did they, did they go to stamping, they also went to folding stocks and synthetic furniture, saving weight, time, and that's, of course, what we have here. We've done several videos on this gun. This is also from Krona Zastava in Yugoslavia. This is their M56, and if this doesn't look much like a Yugo copy or take on a Soviet PPS-42 or PPS-43, that's because for their kind of second generation submachine gun, for whatever reason, Zestava decided to get inspired by the German MP40. Now both these semi-autos were made by uh, Mac Arms, formerly MK Gun Mods. And uh, this one was a real something to get running. It runs pretty okay now. Luckily, the, these this is a little easier. But yeah, these guns were cheaper to make, lighter, and much more compact. So all around, a win. It's even interesting that they bothered doing the M4957 after introducing the M56. It would just seem to, kind of logical to discontinue production. However, much like in Russia, where the PPSH-41 and PPS-43 served alongside each other, they really did kind of complement each other. The uh, M49 and M4957 could be issued to infantry, their select fire, relatively large capacity, good fixed wood stock, sturdy solid sights, good sight radius. 
So this is a good thing to give to infantry on the ground, whereas, just like the MP40, the M56, this is good for mechanized and more urban fighting. Just want something smaller, lighter, maybe not as, you know, accurate, handy, but, you know, we still have a nearly 10-inch barrel, and this has a bayonet lug, and that's what it all matters, right? Interestingly enough, this uses MP40 type mags, although they're not interchangeable. And this too still fires 762 by 25 Tokarev. So I'd say in the mag department, this was only at most a marginal improvement. Really, probably a draw. Although I think these mags are a little cheaper to make. So this was supplemented, allowing this to go to infantry, and this to be used in more of a CQB submachine gun roll. Here we are, and you can see just how much length is saved here. And you're not using much wood. There's a wood block in here as a kind of a buffer, but that's about it. Again, we still have about the same barrel length. Only a slightly reduced magazine capacity. Cheaper to make. Made sense. Although, interestingly, just as this has kind of a good reputation, if maybe unremarkable, the Yugo M56 has a mixed bag reputation. Some, including forgotten weapons, say perhaps the Stava went a little too cheap with these. Especially with disassembly in the back. Yeah, I can, I can kind of understand. Uh, it's, uh, it's a special critter. But it's neat, and it does look like an MP40. But this 50s era... Some machine gun too. Honestly, it was going to be pretty short lived. The days of a military submachine gun, at least in the traditional field use role, were kind of numbered because of the whole new thing on the horizon. Initially, what really dethroned the old school submachine gun, the full size, full weight were self-loading rifles like this. This is, of course, an SKS. This is my M59-66. And for once in 1959, Yugoslavia didn't just reverse engineer. They actually had production approval from Soviet Russia to build these. Originally, they looked just like the uh, Russian, but later they would add a grenade launcher and all that. But really what's important here is the intermediate cartridge. 7.62 by 39. So even though an SKS is semi-auto only with a 10 round mag, they were designed to be topped off quickly, and they had much greater range and, um, you know, multi-purpose use than a submachine gun, frankly. And uh, really not much uh, bigger especially without the grenade launcher, or heavier. Fun thing, if you look, the charging handle, cocking handle, kind of similar. Narrated knob. And the same kind of grouped stock. So that was kind of the first thing, and that's why I kind of assumed the 57 model was out of production. It would not make a lot of sense to produce it, and the M56, and the SKS. So that kind of bounced this out of production, kind of shifting it back to second line use. And the M56 would be their front line submachine gun with this going to the reserves. And in Yugoslavia, the SKS would be front line throughout the early mid 60s. But of course, this too was only a temporary measure because technology is progressing very rapidly during this era, say 1940 to 1960. And of course, you know what comes next. The gun that really put an end to kind of all previous guns, the AK, or in the case of Yugoslavia, the M70. Although there were earlier versions, this was kind of the first to be standardized, originally with a machined receiver, later with stamped. But at first, militaries, especially like Poland, they didn't really know what to make of the AK, this assault rifle concept. 
So a lot of them just kind of pigeonhole it as a submachine gun. But with its intermediate 760 by 39 cartridge, it could do a lot more. And it was select fire, of course. It wasn't much longer at all. If you look here from the original barrel to this. And it was even sometimes lighter, especially when they go to the stamped guns, than these earlier sub guns. Now, guns like the M56 can be shorter and lighter, but of course you can have underfolding AKs. But once they really figured out the use and just the versatility, the flexibility of the AK, that really kind of shifted the SKS to second line use and bounced this M49 and soon thereafter the M56 out of service entirely. That's why this was out of service by 1975, because again, this was officially adopted and put into full rate production in 1970. So by 75, they had plenty of AKs. They had some M56s if they needed them, and they had plenty of SKSs in the back. So really, by the time of the Yugoslavian Civil War, these were not in military service. Now, that's not to say that some didn't get drug out. I mean, if they were in the country, every gun got used during the Civil War. But it was not official military anything at that time. So yeah, it's kind of why it was just short-lived. Well-made gun, but a little too expensive. A little too big and heavy. And the AK just kind of trumped everything. Submachine guns, self-loading guns, even heck other so-called assault rifles, like say the AVT-40. And so that's just why this is kind of a unknown a lesser known gun. There's still a crest on here if you can make it out. It's kind of been painted over. But um, I thought this would be a fun to bring you. It's probably not the most interesting thing, but it's not something you find on YouTube much. There's only a handful of videos. And I thought since there are parts kits available showing a, a build would be neat. I wish I could go into more detail about the build, but YouTube policy, eh, don't want to risk it, but it's pretty straightforward. You'll need, this has the original barrel, but you'll need a uh, US made barrel. You could do 9mm or 760 by 25. You'll need to convert to closed bolt, making a new recoil system in the back. This one's striker fired. You could probably make hammer fired work too. And it's pretty straightforward if you've ever done a PPSH-41, Beretta, or even KP-31 Suomi. So, yeah, there we go, guys. Hope this was interesting, and that's really all the info I could dig up about this old gun. There's just not much out there. Let me know what you think. How you like it compared to the others. And just uh, how interesting it was that Yugoslavia was only starting to field... A generation one submachine gun that they were building in the early 50s when other people were going to full-fledged assault rifles but you know they caught up i guess in time yeah feel free to uh post comments as always we welcome them if you could like share and subscribe and if you'd like to help support of the channel please check out the link to the patreon page this is misha and I'll catch you very soon next time.